1977, a brand new Babcock and Wilcox reactor was installed at the Davis Best site in Ohio. This was a pressurized water reactor, or PWR, essentially a scaled up version of the reactors used in submarines and aircraft carriers in the nuclear navy since the 1950s. It follows that a pool of highly skilled reactor operators trained in the navy with a near perfect safety record were available for these commercial reactors popping up all over the country in the 60s and 70s. This was a double-edged sword however. On the positive side the utilities got highly skilled labor that were already trained so they could save money on training they could trust these guys on the negative side the naval training came with their own set of principles and instincts on how to handle reactor incidents the problem was that a naval reactor at the time was magnet orders of magnitude smaller than a commercial reactor whereas a reactor in a naval vessel, a submarine or an aircraft carrier might be measured in dozens of megawatts. A commercial reactor was typically on the scale of a thousand megawatts. This difference in size was very important. The problems that could affect a submarine were very different than the problems that could affect a commercial reactor. And the operator's training in the naval program will come up later in this talk. The concern to sailors was something known as a water hammer, a sudden shock to the piping system caused by transients in the water flow. So a valve slamming shut or a pump turning on could send shock waves through the incompressible water. This could rip apart piping systems and destroy components. Underwater in a submarine, this could be fatal for the entire crew. The way to avoid this dreaded water hammer was built in to the system. In a pressurized water reactor, the water must be kept at extremely high pressure at all times. Essentially, the hotter you get water, the more pressure it must be under to keep it from boiling. So water at several hundred degrees needs to be kept around 2000 PSI to keep it from boiling. Now this was important because the heat transfer characteristics are very different between liquid water and boiling water. Essentially boiling water will not carry, out, carry away the same amount of heat. So you have to keep these reactors under this constant pressure. This was accomplished with something known as a pressurizer. A pressurizer was a big tank at the top of the pressure system. So typically attached to the hot leg of the reactor. So where the hot water comes out between the reactor and the steam generator. So the steam generator, the hot water runs through there. This creates a steam that spins a turbine. The pressurizer was typically kept around 80% full. It had several jobs. One of them, this 80% full concept, that extra 20% would be air or steam. This created a cushion in the system. So if there was a sudden water hammer, the water had room to expand into that bubble. In addition, the pressurizer had a, basically a shower head at the top to spray cool water in there to reduce pressure in the system and electric coils in the bottom to increase pressure in the system. So this pressurizer controls several things. It's very, very important. The last thing about the pressurizer is that because it's on top of the system, as long as there's water in this tank, you know there's water in the reactor. If the water goes down in the pressurizer, and the pressurizer boils dry, then you only have a matter of time before the reactor itself runs out of water. So the pressurizer is very important in naval training. It was taught to always keep an eye on it. If the pressurizer filled totally up with water all the way to the top, 
This was known as letting the pressurizer go solid. It would fill up with water. This was the last possible thing you wanted to happen underwater in a submarine because any water hammer could potentially destroy the entire system. So these operators in the naval program and in the commercial reactors were obsessed with keeping the pressurizer from going solid. And we'll see in a little bit how that's gonna come up and potentially cause a major accident. On top of the pressurizer is a valve known as the P-O-R-V, or Pilot Operated Relief Valve. This valve was designed to open up if the pressure went above 2200 PSI, and then to close again if the pressure dropped below 1800 PSI. In this way, the system would be protected from overpressurizing. The P-O-R-V would be at the heart of two accidents this first one at Davis Best that we'll talk about, and Three Mile Island, which I'll discuss in a later video. On September 24th, 1977, the reactor at Davis Best was running at 9% power. A sudden shudder in the control room, followed by a cacophony of alarms and lights, alerted the operators to a problem. The control room supervisor, trained in the nuclear navy immediately checked the level of water in the pressurizer the water level was rising indicating a rise in pressure and heat in the reactor core he immediately hit the scram button that sent the control rods into the reactor to stop the fission process the cause of the rise in temperature and pressure was a coolant pump failure in one of the steam generators. The loss of the cooling capacity of a steam generator jolted the system. The steam generator takes heat from the reactor and turns it into steam. If it's no longer working, that heat has nowhere to go. So it goes back into the reactor, causing the rise in heat. And with the rise in heat, you get a rise in pressure. That should have ended the problem, but the operators watched as the pressure in the reactor dropped while the pressurizer remained stable. This was not supposed to occur. If the level of pressure in the reactor drops, the level of water in the pressurizer should drop as well. The computers automatically sensed a problem and activated the emergency core cooling system, or the ECCS. The first step in the system was the high pressure injection system. So large backup pumps that kick in separate from the main cooling system that shoot water into the reactor at 1900 PSI. Nice cool water to keep the reactor cool. At this point, the operators were content with the level of water in the pressurizer. And without knowing exactly why the reactor pressure dropped, they turned the ECCS off, stopping the high pressure injection of cool water into the reactor. Next, the water level in the pressurizer began to rise, indicating a rise in reactor pressure. But the reactor was shut down and cooled by the high pressure injection water. Something was unaccounted for in the system. It's you should not have low reactor pressure and water rising in the pressurizer. It just doesn't make sense. It's as if you were boiling water on the stove and all of a sudden the steam kettle just stops making steam. It doesn't, it, what did not add up what was going on with this reactor. The operators reasoning that the coolant pumps may be heating up the water by their own energy turned the primary coolant pumps off. So now they have no primary cooling water and they've turned the high pressure injection off. So the reactor essentially has no water circulating through it. The water level in the pressurizer went off the scale. It keeps rising. 
At this point, the operators have no firm grasp of what's going on, even though they've turned the emergency core cooling system off. An operator goes behind a console to check the air pressure in the containment building. So this is that giant dome structure with several feet of concrete that houses the reactor, the steam generators, the whole primary cooling system. He notices that it's three PSI over normal and starting to rise. He immediately figures out what is going on. The PORV valve that we talked about before that opens when the reactor overpressurizes has failed to close. This has allowed steam to escape from the primary cooling system. So this pressurized water reactor is no longer pressurized. It's venting all of its steam and energy out of the pressurizer. This causes the water, level water and the pressurizer to rise while the level of pressure in the reactor falls. If left unattended, this water from the reactor would have boiled out of the system and left the fuel uncovered, causing a reactor fuel meltdown. This was doubly terrifying because at this point, before they noticed that the PORV valve was open, there was no water circulating through the reactor. So all we're trusting here is that an operator checks one gauge and realizes what is going on. There's nothing stopping the reactor from melting down except one person checking a gauge. This isn't how it should work. As soon as the operators realized what was going on, they engaged what's known as the block valve, a very simple design that's beneath the PORV valve that operates by remote control manually. So they send a signal, close the block valve, and within a few minutes, the system is back to normal with no danger of a meltdown. The situation occurred over a 26 minute span. The result could have easily been a core meltdown if the reactor was running at higher than 9% power, say 50% or 100% power. The investigators were perplexed by the actions of the operators. Why did they turn the ECCS off only a few minutes into the incident when they didn't really know what was causing the reactor pressure to drop and the pressurizer level to rise? They really had no idea, but they went ahead and turned the safety systems off. The ECCS was meant to protect the system from a meltdown. It almost looked like sabotage. The investigators just could not wrap their mind around why the operators turned the safety system off. The answer, as we have discussed before, was their naval training. The operator's number one priority was keeping the pressurizer from going solid. As soon as they noticed the pressurizer was filling up, thus eliminating that cushion that prevents water hammers, they moved to stop that from happening. The way they chose to do that was by turning off the additional water going into the reactor, the main coolant pumps and the high pressure injection. This should have reduced the level of water and pressure in the system and caused the pressurizer level to go down, which was the result they were looking for. If the PRRV valve was not noticed, so if the reactor operators didn't check that one gauge, the reactor core would have boiled dry and melted. The PORV valve failed due to an unknown worker swapping out a bad relay in a control panel with the good relay in the PORV circuit. So he was essentially working on some equipment, didn't have the relay he needed, he just grabbed a good one from a from the PORV valve circuit, plugged it into where he needed and left. I mean, this is obviously a huge oversight and human error. When the PORV valve was called upon to do its job, so relieve pressure, its logic circuit was fried. It was missing a vital component and it beat itself to death, opening and closing several times, thus breaking it and leaving it wide open. 
The accident was thoroughly investigated, but unfortunately, the results were lost in a web of bureaucratic mess between the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and Babcock and Wilcox Engineering. None of the other seven owners of Babcock and Wilcox reactors were informed of the details of this accident, even though every single reactor had PORV valves, and they all, for the most part, had operators with extensive naval training that were going to keep an eye on these pressurizers above all else. Many of these same themes will arise at Three Mile Island that occurs two years later in 1979. The PORV fault, operators turning off safety systems, and overemphasis on the level of water in the pressurizer will all play a part at Three Mile Island. The difference is that TMI will be running at 100% power when this accident occurs. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. This video is part of a course in the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Program at Hudson Valley Community College. We have plenty of courses online, including this one. If you are interested in continuing your education, please go to hvcc.edu and see what might be available for you.